turn to Section 1. Section 1. You will hear a woman who is applying for a driving licence. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. Now listen and answer questions 1 to 5. Good morning. Can I help you? I'd like to apply for a driving licence. Right. We'll just have to fill in this form. Uh-huh. First, could you tell me your full name? Yes. It's Teresa Collins. Right. The woman says her name is Teresa Collins, so Teresa Collins has been written next to the example on the question paper. Now continue with questions 1 to 5. And what type of vehicle would you like to drive? Oh, just a normal car. That's a Class C licence then. Have you ever held a driving licence in another country? Oh no, I'm too young. Anyway, I think I'd be too scared to drive in another country. Right. I'll just need to get some personal details from you. Um, could I have your date of birth, please? Yes, it's the 17th of March, 1994. And what's your address? 28 River Street. That's spelt R-I-V-E-R. -E Is that right? Yes. And that's in Bentley, isn't it? Yes. OK. And your phone number? I'll give you my home number. It's 37018699. Right. And what form of ID do you have with you? Well, I've got a bank card. Here it is. Let's see. No, we need something with your photo on it, like a student card. I've got that with me. Here you are. Yeah, that's fine. Now, there's an application fee of $55. Uh, how would you like to pay? Uh, we take credit cards, but not cheques, I'm afraid. And we take cash, of course, if you have enough money with you. I do, actually. And I try not to use my credit card if I can avoid it. Here you are. Thank you. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen and answer question 6 to 10. Right. Now, there are a few things I need to tell you about the licence. Before you actually drive a car, you have to pass a test about the road rules. Oh, that's the test about speed limits and road signs and things like that, isn't it? Yes, that's right. There are two parts to the test and you're allowed to make a maximum of two errors in each section. So that's four altogether. And if I fail the test, can I do it again? Yes, you can, but you have to wait at least a week. Right. And when I'm driving, there's got to be someone with me in the car who holds a full licence, doesn't there? Yes. That could be a family member, a professional driving instructor or a friend. What about my older sister? Sure as long as she's got the right kind of licence. Now, the learner's licence is valid for nine months. At the end of that time, you have to do a practical driving test. If you pass that, you're granted a provisional licence. That expires after 18 months. If you don't pass the practical driving test, you're given a learner's licence for another six months. I see. And while I'm still on the learner's licence, how fast can I drive? Well, 
It depends on the area you're driving in. In most places in the city, there's a speed limit of 60 kilometres an hour. As you probably know, on highways in the countryside, there's often a speed limit of 100 kilometres per hour. But as a learner, you're never allowed to exceed 80, even on a highway. Right. I think that'd be fast enough for me anyway. Is there anything else you need to know? Oh, yeah. I heard there are restrictions on using mobile phones while you're driving. That's right. Until recently, you could only talk on a mobile while you're driving if you used an earphone or hands-free device. But that's been changed. Oh? Yeah. Now you can't use mobiles at all while driving. Not even to send an SMS? Not even to send an SMS. Anyway, if that's all, I'll give you a copy of the book on the road rules. Thanks very much. That is the end of Section 1. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to Section 2. Section 2. You will hear a training officer giving a talk to new staff who will be working at the information desk at an airport. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now listen and answer questions 11 to 15. Now, when you're working at the information desk in the arrival section of the airport, one of the most common questions people ask is, what's the best way to get to the hotel or to a particular address once they leave the airport? The answer you give them depends on a number of factors, so I'm going to give you a few general tips to help you deal with these issues by taking the case of a typical destination for the average traveller. After a long flight, people are often tired and want to get to their final destination as soon as possible. You'd think that the quickest way would be to take a taxi, but because of traffic congestion, it turns out that it's usually better to take the train. Trains are cheaper than taxis, and taxis get caught in traffic jams, and they can't go through red lights. For some passengers, the most important consideration is to take a means of transport that is going to run according to schedule. Now, you would think that the train would be the best one for this. But as the airport train is operated by a private company, there have been a lot of problems integrating its running times with the publicly owned train network, and this has resulted in a lot of delays. Surveys on travelling to and from the airport have found that minibuses are the most dependable form of transport. There are other considerations too. If a person wants a comfortable ride with plenty of legroom after a long flight in a cramped seat, it'd be best for them to take one of the large air-conditioned buses. It's a new fleet with plenty of space for luggage, and on top of that, they're much cheaper than taxis. Some passengers are far more concerned about security. Of course, we can't guarantee that they won't be robbed or even cheated by a dishonest driver. So I think for them, the best thing to do is to get someone who they know and trust to pick them up in their car. Finally, there's also the green traveller who wants to cause the least possible pollution. Now, obviously, we can't tell them to walk because it's too far, particularly with heavy luggage. You might guess that public transport would be the cleanest way to travel. But it turns out that it's taxis, and that's because of the type of fuel they use. They're also, not surprisingly, the most popular choice of business people. 
Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. So far, we've been focusing on the arrivals section of the airport. Now we're going to be looking at the departures section. You've all got a copy of the floor plan of the departures section of the airport. Because of the recent renovations, a lot of people are disoriented when they see it for the first time. So you need to be familiar with the new layout. At the bottom of the floor plan, you can see where the passengers check in. They then go through security control and in front of them is the information desk, right in the middle of the whole floor plan. Just to the right of the information desk, there's a news agency where you can buy newspapers and magazines. For those who like to do a bit of shopping, to the left of the information desk we have a jewellery store. It's well worth a look at and a well-stocked electronics goods shop, and between those two there is a pharmacy. There used to be a dress shop in that position. At the top right-hand corner of the diagram we have the waiting lounge and the exit to the planes. In the top left-hand corner are the public toilets. You can use those toilets, or if you like, there are also staff facilities near the bookshop, but you'll need to get the key. Just behind the information desk, we have some food outlets, and over to the right, next to the waiting lounge, is a cafe. When the renovations are completed, it will function as an internet cafe. At most airports, you get people congregating on the footpath smoking, which is unpleasant for the non-smokers entering and leaving the building. For that reason, we've set up a dedicated smoking room inside the terminal next to the bookshop. It's well ventilated and looks out onto the tarmac. The original plan was to put a wine bar next to the bookshop, but there were problems with the licensing laws. I'd encourage you to walk around the airport to familiarise yourselves with the layout so that you can more easily handle passengers' inquiries. That is the end of Section 2. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to Section 3. Section 3. You will hear two college students reporting to their science class about a project they have done on an Australian animal called the Tasmanian Devil. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Now listen and answer questions 21 to 26. Hi everyone. For our assignment on a native animal, George and I chose that unusual Australian creature, the Tasmanian Devil. Yeah. Actually, they don't deserve to be called devils, though they do have some strange habits. Anyway, as their name indicates, they're only found in the wild on the island of Tasmania. You can find them all over the island, including in the southwest rainforests and in coastal heath areas, but they're most commonly found in the forests where there's less rainfall in the eastern and northern parts of the island. In fact, they live any place where they can get shelter during the day and food at night. 
Some of you may have seen one in a zoo. They're about the size of a small dog and are covered with short, soft, black fur with white markings on some parts of their bodies. An adult male can weigh from 5 to 13 kilograms and a female from 4.5 to 9 kilograms. They've got a large head and neck with heavy limbs. They're called devils because of the terrible sounds they make at night. This has given them an undeserved reputation for being aggressive, whereas in fact they're fairly shy creatures. But this doesn't mean that they're tame or friendly enough to be pets. And like kangaroos, they carry their young in a pouch. They have babies only once a year, and then about 20 are born at one time. But at that stage, they're only as big as a grain of rice. The babies have a race to the pouch because there are only four teats there, and the mothers rear an average of three young annually. The babies stay in the pouch for about five months. Then they're left in their nest or are carried on their mother's back when she goes out, and eventually they have to look after themselves at about eight months. Then they in turn start breeding at the end of their second year. And around 60% of them die in their first summer due to the tough competition for food. The ones that survive can live for up to seven years, which means they don't live as long as the average domestic dog. No. And it's estimated that now there are between 100,000 and 150,000 of them altogether. They were almost wiped out by the early European settlers because they hated the devils eating their chickens. So the government paid people to kill Tasmanian devils. And most farmers still dislike them. Their numbers fell so drastically due to farmers poisoning them or shooting them that it was thought that they might have become extinct. Then a law was passed in 1941 to protect them. And since then, their numbers have grown again. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 27 to 30. Now we'd like to talk about some of their habits. They live alone in places such as hollow logs, caves, or in burrows underground, which they line with bark, grass and leaves. They usually move slowly and look clumsy when they move quickly, but the young ones are more agile and can even climb trees. But one of the most amazing things about Tasmanian devils is how and what they eat. They've got incredibly strong teeth and jaws, so a large male can give you a bite as strong as a 50 kilogram dog. But don't worry, they don't eat people. Some farmers complain about them taking young lambs, but their diet consists predominantly of animals that have already died. They don't get ill when they eat sick animals because of the digestive enzymes in their own stomachs that kill the diseases. And they've got an undeserved reputation for being smelly, whereas in fact they wash themselves as much as cats do. They're nocturnal animals, so they go hunting at night, often travelling up to 15 kilometres and using their strong sense of smell to find food. They eat all kinds of animals, and they eat everything, including fur, and leave nothing behind except the largest bones. Yeah, there can be up to 22 of them feeding off one carcass at the same time, and they're very greedy, noisy eaters. In all the excitement of eating, there's a lot of coughing, barking and so on. It's quite common for them to bite each other to decide who can eat first, who goes second and so on. And they've got an incredible appetite. They can eat the equivalent of 40% of their own body weight in just half an hour, which is like a human eating about 25 kilograms of steak. And they make really good use of their strong, blunt teeth. When they're frightened, they show them by yawning, which is more effective than biting or barking. But the only serious fighting that takes place is when they're looking for a mate. All in all, they're a fascinating little animal. That is the end of Section 3. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turn to section 4. Section 4. You will hear a lecture by a healthcare researcher to students of health science about the results of a survey on yoga in Australia. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen and answer questions 31 to 40. Good afternoon everyone. In today's lecture I'm going to present some of the findings of the largest and most comprehensive survey of yoga practice ever conducted in Australia. The objectives of this survey were to investigate the characteristics of people who practice yoga in this country. Uh, the styles and techniques of yoga that are practiced, how often people practice yoga, the reasons why they do yoga, and the perceived benefits of yoga practice. It is our hope that the findings of this survey will be of help to both teachers and students of yoga in this country and abroad, as well as to healthcare practitioners. Prior to our study, no nationwide research had been conducted into the topic. Our research team decided to do a web-based survey so that we would reach the maximum possible number of people all around the country and also due to our funding limitations. The survey was promoted through yoga schools, the media and by word of mouth. Eventually, uh, almost 4,000 people responded to the survey, which took about 30 minutes to complete. About one third of the people who filled in the survey were yoga teachers. The other two thirds were yoga students. Overall, 85% of the respondents were women. Yoga means different things to different people and reflecting its diversity there are many types of yoga. Our survey found that it is males and younger people who are more attracted to some of the physically more demanding styles of yoga that have gained in popularity in the West over the past two decades, whereas older age groups went for more relaxing styles. Apart from providing exercise, yoga can also be a form of therapy, meditation or a spiritual path. Government agencies have found that around 2% of the adult population practice yoga to a greater or lesser extent, with a much lower participation rate for people who have not yet turned 18. Both their research and our survey found that the age group with the highest participation rate in yoga classes is the 35 to 44 year old group. There has been a slight decline recently in the popularity of yoga. However, this was in the context of a reduction in physical activities overall among the Australian population. A major reason for this trend is not the rise in the popularity of junk food, but because more and more people are playing computer games. 56% of the yoga students who responded to our survey attend class once or twice a week. In contrast, and not surprisingly, the same percentage of the yoga teachers in our survey said they taught or practiced yoga between five and seven times per week. Most people initially take up yoga to improve their health and fitness, with an emphasis on flexibility and strength but also in order to reduce stress or as a treatment for a physical problem, particularly for a bad back. Many of the respondents to our survey stated that their reasons for doing yoga changed after they started doing regular practice, with more than half claiming that they keep at it for their personal development 
which could be interpreted in a variety of ways. Although overall yoga promotes physical and mental health, it can cause damage if not done properly. And care needs to be taken with inverted postures such as the headstand and shoulder stand, as well as with the lotus position, which is the cross-legged position that is commonly associated with yoga and meditation. A common admission in the survey among those who had sustained injuries was that they had pushed themselves too hard. Far less frequently, teachers were said to have caused injuries by pushing students too hard. A large number of our survey respondents reported that they work in healthcare occupations and for most of the yoga teachers, teaching yoga is not their only source of income. Among the students, the most common healthcare occupation is nursing, whereas among teachers, the largest group worked as massage therapists. Many also worked as nurses, psychologists and practitioners of alternative medicine. In the survey, we also looked at incomes. We didn't ask for individual incomes, but household incomes. That is, the total income of all the people that survey respondents lived with. We found that around three quarters of the students and 60% of the teachers have a household income above $50,000 per year. Whereas just 9% of the students are on an annual household income below $30,000, one in five of the teachers belong to this group. It would seem that being a yoga teacher is not a path to riches. Yoga itself isn't that expensive, with the average person spending just under $100 a month on yoga practice and accessories. Overall, yoga was found to have a positive impact on people's lives, with a clear majority concluding that their physical, mental and emotional health, as well as their relationships, were better or much better than before they started doing yoga. That is the end of Section 4. You now have half a minute to check your answers. That is the end of the listening test. You now have 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet.